Hey, what's up? It's Alfonso Wanna Ask. The Fonz. Today we're gonna continue with part three of the Behind the Edit series with Richard and Colleen Halsey, ACE. Before I begin, I really appreciate if you guys hit the like button down below. It helps me reach aspiring filmmakers all around YouTube and social media. So um, if you hit the like button, YouTube will push out this content to you know all the aspiring film editors and filmmakers out there who you know want to reach my content and advice. So really appreciate it if you guys hit the like button down below so that I could reach that audience and help my channel grow. In this episode of Behind the Edit, I asked Richard and Colleen, you know, how they got their start in film editing and how they broke into this industry. You know, before I begin the interview, I do want to mention that, you know, everyone has their own path in this industry. And I think that's really important to keep in mind because, you know, there is no one size fits all formula guide because, you know, everyone has their own experiences. Everyone has their own path. You know, some people are naturally going to climb up faster than others. And that's okay, you know, and then some others are going to take years and, you know, years being an assistant or years being a post BA or even, you know, an intern or a logger. And you just have to keep going and keep, you know, fighting through it. And eventually you'll get that opportunity and you'll be considered for the next gig. But I think the biggest theme here and the biggest point I want to make is stay patient and, and keep trying and keep going because, you know, everyone, again, has their own path. There is no wrong way of doing it. So I just want you to keep that in mind while you're listening to the interview and, you know, and also reflecting on your own career, because that's really important. You know, I think we all put so much stress on on ourselves as far as just like getting to the goal as fast as possible. And, you know, I think that's sort of the wrong mentality to think about it. And I think, you know, everyone is learning at their own speed and learning at their own level and being able to challenge yourself obviously is the most important thing and, and sort of enjoying the process that comes with it. Every time I, you know, think about my next steps after each gig, I sort of reflect on, you know, th these are the questions I ask, you know, I ask, what experience am I looking for next? You know, I obviously want to challenge myself. So do I feel ready to move up just a little bit, you know, like thinking about, uh, just responsibilities as assistant editor, you know, um, there are a ton of responsibilities that you go through during the gig. So, you know, what did I like about the last gig? Should I, you know, pursue more of that responsibility or should I pursue something more uh, difficult for myself so that I can, you know, challenge myself and feel like I can, you know, learn and grow from something that I haven't done before, you know, and especially, you know, when you're sort of in this weird limbo phase of, you know, you've done a couple assistant editor gigs and you're slowly starting to feel like you're getting the hang of it. And then now you're in this limbo phase of, you know, you want to start being more creative and you want to start feeling like you're part of the editing process, like the creative editing process. So that's sort of the, the difficult part is to kind of figuring out, you know, when should you really make the jump to editor? Again, don't put so much pressure on yourself because this is a very situational subject. And you know, ultimately, you know, you want to do what's best for yourself and grow as an editor. So keep this theme in the back of your head while the interview's going. Hopefully you'll learn something from, you know, Richard and Colleen and their experiences and how they got their start. So hopefully this will help you and make you reflect on your career as well. So you can sort of make the right decisions uh, navigating your career. So without further ado, let's get right into part three of Behind the Edit with Richard and Colleen Halsey, ACE. So um, I guess let's go backtrack a little bit and ask sort of, how did you guys both get your start in editing? Or was it sort of like a, something that you were passionate well, basically, about? Basically, basically, I started as a messenger boy at Warner Brothers Studio, and then I got into the editorial department as like a runner. Mm. And then I got into music editing and then left Warner Brothers and went to 20th Century Fox and got on the TV show Peyton Place as an assistant editor. And two years later, one of the editors died Oh no, so morbid. <laughs> <laughs> and I got my break editing. Wait, so you got your first editing credit because somebody died? Yeah, yeah, a guy by the name of George Bembler, who's a great old editor. And so after I did that, I wanted to break into features. And I wrote a letter to one of the greatest film editors of all time, who cut Ben Hur. His name was Ralph Winters. Mm -hmm. I wrote him a letter told him I'd been an editor in television, but I wanted to be an assistant and break into features. Two weeks later, he called me, 
said, Richard, I got you a job. You're going to go to work on Hal Ashby's first picture as a director called The Landlord. But you weren't the other. You were the assistant. Yeah, I was the assistant. The assistant. Yeah. And then one thing led to another, and that was... And then I went to... Uh, from there, I went to work on five easy pieces as an assistant editor and editor. And then I got my first job at American International Pictures on one of their silly movies. I'm trying to remember. Oh, Something in the Attic? Yeah. Th it was called The Late Boy Wonder. Take off on the, the famous movie with Dustin Hoffman. Are you Midnight Cowboy? No, 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 no. Plastics. The guy has a line. Plastics. Oh, the graduate. Yeah, kind oh, of a takeoff on the graduate. And the script was pretty damn good. And then we start shooting, and they rewritten the script. It didn't even resemble what the script was. I read, you know, and so you know, but you, basically, I got a break. I knew this cameraman, and he recommended me to a director by the name of Daryl Duke. And he produced and directed a movie called Payday. It was like uh, 36 hours in the life of a country western singer starring Rip Torn. And it made, it was a million dollar film, grossed $36,000 in the United States, <laughs> but made all the critics top 10 lists. I have a picture of it right here. Yeah, <laughs> Payday. It, it was a good picture. Yeah. Good picture. Tough, tough movie. And uh, so basically, as a very famous agent manager said to me, Keith Addis, he said, Richard, either you've got to have a very financially successful movie or you got to have a movie that the critics like. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Wow, that's 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 like yeah. a very interesting th thought to think about as far as like managing your career and approaching what oh, yeah. how to hit those jackpots. Yeah, of yeah but you have to have a bit of luck too. Yeah, you know you have to have a bit of luck. Of course, you know if I got with an I got with an established um, producer, director, writer, Paul Mazursky, who I played tennis with at Plummer Park. Mm -hmm. And I invited him to a screening of Payday. He saw the film. I turned around and looked at it after the film was over. And he gave me the big thumbs up. Two weeks later, he called me. He said, Richard, I'm doing a picture called Harry and Tonto. I'd like you to edit it. There it is. And Art, Art Carney won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Wow. And the studio was not prepared for it. It's a long story. And and Bill Conti did the score. Oh, Bill Conti did it too. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then, as how about you, Colleen? Did you? How did you get your start uh, film editing? Oh, it's in, uh, I went to San Francisco Art Institute Film School, and I didn't finish. And um, I was in another marriage then. I left my husband, came to LA, and my sister, my twin sister, introduced me. Well, I had known John Bailey and Carol because they would come visit me in, uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, we were friends to begin with. And so Carol um, Littleton, uh, who I was introduced by my sister, uh, gave me a list of 30, like 30 names of different editors to call. And she says, now you don't you know, pester these people, but <laughs> yes, you call. Yes. Yeah. You know, enough, you be persistent, but don't pester. And so I was calling and uh, Richard was actually on the list. And I think I called, I had set up an appointment for to meet him here at my house here now, downstairs in our editing room. I drove all the way from Malibu, came here, went down, knocked on his editing room door. His assistant answered the door and he only like peeked his head. I, had <laughs> up like, I said, I have an appointment with... Uh, Richard, he says, he's busy. And just slammed the door on me. Oh, I didn't know about this. Yeah. 
And so I'm so upset, you know, like I had this interview with the Academy Award winning editor and I drove all this way and I didn't get in to see him. And why was, why was he, why did he have me come if he wasn't going to see me? And I was so upset. Yeah, it was a mix up. And so then almost a year later, Richard calls my sister because she was an agent and she wasn't a, an agent then. I think she became a manager by that time. She says, he says, I need a job. And uh, I'm working on this Don Union picture, but I'm, you know, I, I want to get a better job. She says, oh, Don Union, my sister's trying to get into, she's been, had a few little jobs, but she hasn't had, had a, break, a break yet because uh, it's so tough to get, it, things were really tough then. I mean, you basically, if you didn't, weren't in the union, it was a real catch 22. And uh, he says, oh, she's your sister. And he, she says, yeah. And he says, well, is she half as good looking as you are? Now, this was real PC then. <laughs> and she says, she's my twin sister. And Richard says, she's hired. <laughs> no way. Yes. Oh <laughs> I said, the first thing I do, I get, to, uh, I get, and I was, I was dating this guy and um, we had planned a ski vacation and then a trip to New York for Christmas week. <laughs> So I, like a week into the job, I went to Rich and I said, I need two weeks off. <laughs> and he said, okay. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> was, wow. yeah, he was so nice. It, it was a dumb movie we were working on, but that's, that's where we met. And then right from there, we went to Down and Out, we Beverly, went to Hills. Down and Out in Beverly Hills and Colleen got grandfathered in because they, when you form a company, oh, getting grand, she got grandfathered in on wow. that. So I got, I, I really lucked out. Lucked out with the union stuff. Yeah. Wow, and, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching part three of this Behind the Edit series with Richard and Colleen Halsey, ACE. I hope you got a lot out of it and enjoyed listening to how they got their start in the film editing industry. You know, Richard, you know, starting out as a messenger boy and then, you know, moving up to being an assistant editor and then so morbidly getting his first editing break because, you know, the previous editor died. And then him writing a letter to Ralph Winters, uh, the editor of Ben-Hur, and breaking into the feature film industry that way. So it was very interesting to learn, you know, the progression and, you know, how he became a film editor. And then obviously Colleen also has a very interesting story in how she met Richard and getting, you know, turned away from her first uh, quote-unquote interview with Richard without even, you know, seeing him. And his assistant kind of just turned her away and her feeling upset and defeated. And then two years later, her sister connected her with Richard later on, and then they worked together on a small independent project. And then she eventually got a co-editing credit on, you know, Down and Out in Beverly Hills, and then went on to work on, you know, 60 plus films after that and established herself as, you know, a top Hollywood A-list editor. So it's very interesting, you know, just the progression of how, you know, both paths are obviously different and definitely share a lot in common. And I do want to talk about, you know, all those things right now and delve deeper into this topic of you know, career paths and how we navigate through this industry. So the first topic I want to talk to you about is everyone has their own path. That's really important to embrace and to emphasize on. I've obviously given, you know, guidelines and ways and methods to set yourself up successfully and being able to navigate and make the right decisions when the time arises. But, you know, ultimately it's up to you and it's up to how your career flows. I also want to mention that Becoming an editor, you know, it takes time and it's, it's a process. And the more you can enjoy that process, the more you can enjoy the small nuances of, you know, being a post PA, being an assistant editor and eventually becoming an editor, you know, you'll, you'll have a more pleasant experience because ultimately that's what everyone is after is the experiences making films and editing it all together. I think that's what should be loved, you know, about this whole process. You know, I also want to mention that we should think about this process and we should think about becoming an editor, you know, as a marathon. You know, it's always that, you know, cliche quote, it's, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And we have to really enjoy that process, you know, and I think we always put being an editor to its ultimate pedestal and we strive and strive and strive. And then once we get it, you know, we kind of forget why we love editing. So I think starting from the bottom and really enjoying the process from the beginning will, you know, help and make that achievement of getting to being an editor more satisfying and more enjoyable. 
when I talk about, you know, the process and when I talk about falling in love with that process, you know, what does that really mean, right? Like, what am I actually talking about? So I want to explain, you know, the small details that the process is all about. You know, the process means to me is, you know, going in every day, day in, day out to your gig and being very consistent and delivering things on time, showing up to work early, creatively listening and being engaged in the process, being respectful to your peers. Overall, you know, being a very good assistant or being a very good post BA or intern or logger or whatever it is that will help expedite the workflow in, in whatever gig you're in. So that I think is the biggest thing, being very consistent in delivering whatever your tasks or your responsibilities are. And then the second is when you're not employed and you're looking for gigs and you're still trying to figure out your next step, the process of what you're going through is, you know, sending out your cold emails and reaching out to people for advice and setting up your informational interviews. When you don't have a job, your job is to find a job, right? So cut back on, you know, the small distractions that go on during the times you, you know, have time, which is when you're unemployed. So you know, make it a point from like nine to five, you're going to work, quote unquote, you know, so that you can help yourself move to the right direction. So that also is under the umbrella of obviously the process. The third is, you know, learning all the different programs. You know, again, if you're unemployed and you have all this time, why not use this time to, you know, learn all the different programs and learn all the different software if you're lagging in that department. And that means going on YouTube and looking up Premiere tutorials or, you know, graphic design or visual effects, anything that you need help on. And I mean, even just editing something, you know, for fun is going to help you because, you know, editing is editing. And the more you can get your mind to sort of solve puzzles and troubleshoot things, you know, ultimately the skill that you're going to get out of it is you being faster in troubleshooting or solving, you know, problems as they arise. So, you know, learn as much as you can during the free time you have. And the next thing is, you know, when you are employed and you're on a gig, you know, shadow your editors, shadow your assistants or shadow your producers if you get a chance, just so you can start, you know, getting a bigger sense of, you know, how the editing room runs. For me, I've always loved to knock on my editor's door and just say, hey, can I just sit in here for 10 to 15 minutes and just watch your work? And, you know, I'll have questions at the end. Maybe I can ask you at lunch, you know, I'll, I'll have you again, you bring your notebook and you write down things that you're, you're observing and um, specifically like what scene they're working on and how the editor is bringing the story to life. And if the editor doesn't want to be distracted, you obviously, you know, read the room and, and just, you know, stay silent. But if the editor is open to asking questions about their thought process, I think that is the most useful part about shadowing your editors is being able to hear their thoughts as they're working through the cut, because no one really shares that, you know, especially live when you're actually editing a scene. So definitely ask those questions because you'll get a lot out of that, especially when you're starting to edit scenes on a you know really fast pace. And when you're editing a TV show, you're gonna be cutting you know four or five scenes a day. So you have to know how they do it so that you can also apply their knowledge and make it work for you as well. So definitely shadow your editors and shadow your assistants as well. Post PA, if you're an intern or if you, you know, you're visiting the cutter room for a day, um, anything that you know allows you to be in the editing room just keep asking questions and stay curious because those questions will help you lead to the right path as far as navigating through, you know, how the editing room runs. Edit anything you can get your hands on, you know, whether it's professionally, you know, when you're obviously, you know, still working, you have a side project, like definitely edit a side project. Or if it's something, you know, personal, like, you know, a wedding for your cousin or your wedding for your, you know, brother or sister. Edit as much as you can, because again, like I said before, you know, editing is editing, you know, anything to get your mind sort of figuring out puzzles or figuring out, you know, problems and solving them is the lessons that you're going to take away from all those projects. You know, I edited Recently, I edited a commercial and this commercial was very graphics heavy. And there was just one thing that I learned because I just stumbled upon it, you know, trying to figure out how to solve a problem. You know, it was a specific visual effects issue where I was motion tracking something and there was just an option that allowed me to customize where the track was keyframe by keyframe. And it was just something small and technical, but you know, from now on, like whenever I motion track something, I'll remember that tip. And now I can obviously you know, improve on how to create a better flowing motion track. And 
understand how to do that more more accurately and more properly. So, you know, if I hadn't done that gig, I would have never, you know, stumbled upon it. Again, these are the things that you you go through and these are the things that you're going to learn is the small nuances of editing, the small tips that you bump into, you're going to start experiencing them. And then when a problem like that arises in the future, you know, you're quick to it because you're going to be able to solve it very quickly because you've obviously run into it before. So that's, I think, the main part about that is, you know, obviously editing for editing's sake is obviously the main purpose, but the small nuances of learning something new because you've gone through that process, I think is even a bigger deal. So yeah, so edit as much as you can and edit anything you can get your hands on. When you have a chance, put this on your list too, as well as watch a lot of films and pay attention to the editing when you get a chance. You know, I always preach this because you can learn a lot by just watching a film. You really, any, any film, learn a lot about editing, learn about, you know, the behind the scenes of how they put it all together. There's a lot of interviews now on YouTube and I'm sure you can look up any film and read or hear some narration of a really cool anecdote that happened on set or happened behind the scenes in the editing room. I, you know, I do this a lot with, you know, just films in general that I watch, you know, I get so into it. I really want to know how they, how they made it. Get into the habit of that because it exercises your mind and seeing, you know, what are the possibilities out there for how to put together a film. It's just a great way to expand your knowledge on filmmaking and behind the scenes. And then lastly is always try to stay patient with your career. Like I said in the beginning, everyone has their own path. If you feel like you're that person that's taking five, seven years on trying to become an editor or even longer or 10 years or 20 years, it can get really exhausting to be sort of pigeonholed as an assistant editor or a post PA, but keep trying and keep going. And I think that's sort of the mentality I have is, you know, everyone will eventually become an editor as long as you keep going. I really do believe in that. And, you know, some people will say, no, well, if you're an assistant past this age and, you know, you sort of have missed your mark, tune out those noises and really prove yourself and find ways to showcase yourself as an editor if you're in that situation. Continue to keep editing on the side, take as much editing opportunities as you can, make a website, create a reel for yourself and start putting your name out there. There are a lot of actionable steps into, you know, making the jump as an editor. So don't ever feel like you'll be pigeonholed as an assistant forever because, you know, I, I, I personally just don't believe in that. I think, you know, if you have the drive and passion to make it as an editor, you know, it doesn't have to be like on a top TV show or a top movie, you know, you just have to get the credits in the beginning and then work your way up to eventually becoming on those top shows. Like I said before, editing is editing. So the more you can edit, the more opportunities you'll have and the more people you meet. And, you know, if you do a good job, you know, people will remember you. You just never know when, you know, someone will start up a new show that becomes the next hit TV show or hit movie. Enjoy the process of editing. Ultimately, that's, you know, why we do it. And that's why everyone enjoys this craft. So yeah, so stay patient and just keep trucking along and, and don't give up. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, I, I sort of want to start editing as well. But, you know, when I reflect on my career, you know, I haven't obviously done that much yet, you know, and as far as editing. So I got to, you know, push myself to continue editing more and, and putting my name out there as an editor. So again, it's just the process. Obviously, continue still working as an assistant and improving myself as an editor so that when I do get that opportunity, you know, I can shine and hopefully leave a good impression. So yeah, so that's something I think that to sum up, you know, what the process really means, I think that those are the details, you know, enjoying all of those things I just listed and doing this day in and day out and being in love with editing and falling in love with this because ultimately, you know, the credits and the trophies or the awards are all kind of just, you know, cherries on top and the ice cream is everything else. <laughs> And then the next topic that I want to talk about that I took away from this interview was, you know, Richard and Colleen did a form of cold calling and informational interview. Richard reached out to Ralph Winters, who was the editor of Ben-Hur, and, you know, wrote him a letter and said, hey, you know, I've been editing TV for a while. And I want to break into features. And he put his name out there. Colleen also did something very similar, right? When she reached out to her longtime friend and accomplished editor, Carol Littleton, and she gave, you know, Colleen a list of editors to contact. And, you know, Colleen obviously reached out. So um, doing this sort of uh, informational cold calling form of reaching out is very smart and it'll accelerate your career pretty fast. 
if you do it right and if you appropriately reach out to people and cast a wide net to, you know, to get a bigger network and to start putting your name out there. This is a very useful tool or useful skill to do, especially when you don't have any contacts in the industry. Nowadays, it's you know, much easier to reach out to editors or assistants because the internet has sort of helped us uh, connect much more easily. You can sort of look up people on LinkedIn, you can Google people's names or look them up on IMDb and get an email or a LinkedIn message or a Facebook message and sort of introduce yourself that way. You know, maybe nine times out of 10, they probably won't respond, but that's okay. You know, all you need is that one person to sort of get the ball rolling and to sort of help you out. I think this is a very useful skill and I'm probably going to make, you know, a separate video again on this, but I do have a, a video that talks about this and reaching out to people. But, you know, I want to make another one that, you know, emphasizes this a bit more and goes into more detail. But yeah, so that was something that I thought was very interesting is they both sort of had this method of cold calling or informational interview parts of their careers. For me personally, that's the way I started is to I just reached out to a lot of assistants and a lot of editors and just ask for their advice and to befriend them and get to know them because ultimately people want to help you if you are their friend and sort of how do you, you know, get on their friend side or how do you, you know, get on the radar for, you know, jobs and prospective opportunities, get to know them, you know, ask them questions about, you know, how they got their start and, you know, what, what do they like, you know, hobbies, you know, interests and, just get to know them as people instead of gunning for that, you know, what you want, which is a job. You know, you have to sort of build a relationship out of this. So I think that's really important. You know, the quote that I live by when I do all these informational interviews and network is, if you ask for a job, you'll get advice. If you ask for advice, you'll get a job. That really emphasizes how to approach and cold email people because you want to be on their side of things. You can't just like email someone and ask for a job because they don't know who you are. So you need to sort of build that relationship and build that foundation before they can start feeling like they can genuinely help you. It's a very natural and human instinct thing to do is, you know, you want to help people that who are your friends. So why not start, you know, building a relationship? It doesn't have to be a great friendship. You know, you just want to show a very professional side to you that, you know, you do care about what the person who's helping you, you know, does, you know, you obviously respect and want them to help you. So befriend them first, you know, really just try to get to know them. So I think that's a very important quote to live by. And for me, I've always kind of just live by that, especially when I reach out to editors, I always think, what can I do for them first? You know, obviously they don't know who I am. So, you know, I want to get to know them first as people and, and see just who they are and, and what their likes and interests are. You know, my alma mater, Emerson College, actually started this new forum for outreach to current students and, you know, recent graduates. And there was this discussion that started. And the question was, I want to read it because it's so good. It's such a great answer to this topic of networking. And basically the question was, what advice do you have for someone who's new to networking? And I will credit the person because she, she gave such a great answer. And I think this is, this should be shared. And that's why I'm sharing and I'm giving you word by word what she says. It's the person who gave the answer is Iris McQuillan. And she says, my advice in regards to networking is to use a farming, not hunting mentality. Farming takes time. You plant seeds and then tend to them in order for them to grow and flourish. Farming is also seasonal. There are seasons when nothing is coming up from the ground and there are seasons where you can't keep up with growth. Hunting, you shoot what you can kill and then eventually you run out of food. I often see that people only reach out when they need something, hunting, rather than keeping up with their contacts and establishing new ones when they need nothing, or in fact, are offering something, which is farming. Happy to share more thinking about this. If anyone is interested, happy farming, Emerson. That, you know, that's just 110% truth. I mean, you know, being in the film editing industry for six years, I just really feel this, you know, it, it's really true. And, and when you're farming and you're growing these relationships year after year, and, you know, that is sort of the, the way that you should approach, you know, networking and connecting because um, ultimately, again, like I said, you have to build relationships and you have to form these foundations so that people will genuinely want to help you, you know, and that means, you know, 
congratulating them on specific life events. You know, if the person achieved something or got married or has a newborn, all these small things, you should, you know, just comment and just say, hey, congratulations, I saw this on Facebook or blah, blah, blah. Um, or even on Facebook or whatever, you you see it, just you know, like it and just say congratulations. Or if it's their birthday, you say happy birthday. You know, all these things go a long way. And I think it's it's really important to, you know, you can stay in contact with that, you know. But again, be genuine. Obviously, don't fake this. You know, this is, a, this is very important. Like, I'm not here to tell you just continue to like everything that the person posts, but have a genuine interest in learning about this person because you know, that's ultimately what this industry is about is building relationships and working together to create, you know, something fun like a movie. So uh, ultimately, it's about the people and who you're working with and staying in touch that way. So that's sort of the approach that I think, you know, I obviously really believe in is, you know, farming versus a hunting mentality. So definitely keep farming and definitely growing all those relationships. And you'll see eventually you're just going to have this awesome network that you know, you'll just want to keep working with the same people over and over again. And that's the that's the dream. So, um, yeah, definitely keep farming and not hunting. And then the last topic I want to talk about that I really took away from this interview is just to never give up. I mean, never give up and try to be happy and, and doing so and enjoying it. You know, I've heard countless of stories that you know, people just want to quit because it's just doesn't make them happy. And, you know, and then you have this battle of like, you just can't give up. Personally, I think, you know, if you can, and I know it's difficult because you can't really control the environments of the production, but try to find the editing gigs that suit your needs as far as, you know, what are you looking for? Some people, you know, they have other life things that happen, you know, and you should really take that into account because your mental health, I think, is the most important part here. You know, if you have a family member that falls ill and you want to take care of them from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., you have to have ob other obligations or, you know, you want to spend more time with your kids. Hopefully, you know, you'll be able to balance that with your schedule. You know, obviously, this is a very, you know, complicated topic because all productions have their own sort of ways and nuances and details to them. You know, I want to support people who want to take gigs that make them happy because, you know, working with the Halseys, you know, I've learned so much in editing, but also I've learned so much in, you know, work-life balance. You know, they have got that down to a science. You know, for me, I like to take vacations in between gigs and not really go gig by gig by gig. You know, financially, that'll obviously set me back. But at the same time, like, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm okay with not earning money for two or three months because I've decided to take a break. And, you know, again, when I talk about the financial side, it's like I already plan for me not working for two to three months after my gig. So really start to form your own schedule. And I think I really love about freelance is that you can do that you know you're in control of your your schedule and if you want to go travel or just take a vacation and spend time with your family or spend time with your friends or just literally just like decompress for like a good two or three months then that's okay you know and I think this always goes by the wayside is like the mental health part and our physical health and we're stuck in the room for you know for a while and I think that's something to to share is like Really strive for that work-life balance. You know, every production is different. You know, some are more demanding than others. And we obviously can't change that. We obviously have to do our best to build a lifestyle around that. But it's good to think about that and to reflect on what you want and what you want out of life and what you want out of this career. Because, you know, in this episode, I really felt like that's a very relatable topic as far as, you know, just career paths and navigating the freelance life and, you know, just being able to set your own schedule. And I think that, you know, this is very important to, to talk about. So thank you so much for watching part three of this Behind the Edit series with Richard and Colleen. I do hope you got a lot out of what they shared, you know, from how they broke into the industry and how they shared their beginnings and their path into breaking as, you know, Hollywood editors. I, I really hope you got a lot out of that. And I hope you got a lot out of the takeaways that I shared as far as, you know, um, networking and navigating your career and building your own path into becoming a Hollywood film editor. I do want to mention that I do one-on-one -on -one mentorship calls. So with this topic of creating your own path and navigating through the editing industry, you know, I really do want to help, you know, all the passionate aspiring film editors out there get their start and set you up for success. Because, you know, I've been through this, you know, I, you know, have gone through the process and, you know, really understood, you know, how to really navigate yourself through this. You know, I'll share with you all of the 
things that I wish I should have done or things that, you know, I did well in and things that have, you know, led me to where I am right now. And I think really be helpful for, you know, any recent college graduate or anyone who wants to break into this industry, talk to someone in, in the future, quote unquote, to, to kind of help them and navigate their career and start your career as a Hollywood editor. So yeah, so reach out to me. If you go to my website at www.askthefonz.com and you hit the schedule mentorship tab, you can go ahead and schedule an appointment with me and we'll talk about this topic in greater detail. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button down below. I obviously share a lot of these videos. Part four will be coming up soon. So uh, definitely hit the subscribe button. It'll notify you when, when uh, all my videos are uploaded. So hit the subscribe button. Also check all my social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, you know, every single social media outlet that's out right now. My handle is at askthefonz. So definitely check that all out. And thank you so much for watching. I hope you found something useful here. Until next time.